guys to the abs grand tournament this is the top 16 players single elimination tournament we will be seeing a lot of good players here i'm sitting here with subtle how are you doing man yeah i'm doing good uh really really excited about this tournament this is probably the like the, the highest overall level of player pool that i've had an opportunity to cast so i'm just uh really looking forward to some really high level matches today yeah we have some incredible players here who who had been in the top 16 in blizzard like twice even so you know um we we i mean uh, top 16 blizzcon qualifiers so we have gara orange firebat hoi rdu powder kaldi phone tab ties ecop roger cypher neria tom 602229 and sansivka and ostkaka so a Nicely lot of good done. players and but more importantly what is abios because this is our this is our sponsor here this is the basically well, the organizer of the tournament and Abius is a a go-to place when it comes to esports. It's a calendar. It's a up real-time, up-to-date when it comes to matches. You can check uh, schedules. You can check results there. Uh, it's like a global calendar, and it has ten games. Recently, it also uh, it also was uh, adding Smosh Bros. So if you're into fighting games, you have the two. You have a Firefox and Chrome extension. So yeah, basically, just check them out. You know. And also, remember, when you tweet about the tournament, use the hashtag ABIOSGT, so like Grand Tournament. And then you have a way um, to be featured on stream and also be participating in a giveaway. giveaway. And yeah, basically that's it. Yeah, really exciting stuff. Um, ABIOS definitely looking like it'll be a, a big tool for the, the esports scene going forward. So um, definitely if they're willing to get involved with big tournaments like this, like it's win-win, right? You have a great utility and someone that's uh, involved in, in putting on great shows like this for you guys to watch. So look out for ABIOS moving forward. Yep, definitely they're up and coming. And you can also use some comments in the Twitch chat. So exclamation mark bracket, exclamation mark giveaway. Wow, that actually works now. Yeah. <laughs> Then um, exclamation mark extensions and exclamation mark Firefox Chrome and of course if you want some tournament informations then exclamation mark Abius GT and uh, that's it. Um, first match will be Gara versus Orange and we have some really interesting lineups and I'm really saying that right yeah, because, yeah you know <laughs> you should say that it's it's because it, it actually is weird <laughs> you have mirror priests yeah really interesting um i think gara is is known as a, a bit of a priest player long term it's definitely been one of his his pet classes even when the class wasn't particularly good uh so no surprise now there are a couple of really highly viable builds of priests both the control priest and dragon priest have been showing good results recently um, no surprise to see him favor bringing the priest because we know that it's a class that he does favor. Orange, not so much. I know whether he's a, he's a priest fan in the long term, but surprise, slightly surprisingly to me, he's bringing priest as well. So that's true. And uh, both bringing druid and priests, mm -hmm. but there's a um, difference in the third class. Garros playing warrior. I would like to say that he will not be playing patron. Okay. I'm mm, I'm kind of like when I think about Gara. I'm not exactly pinning him on Patreon. Okay. Usually I see him like using decks that are not exactly, you know, like cookie, uh, cookie cutters, right? Right. And I would say he would be bringing some Contra, contra Warrior, I would say. Okay. Right. And then we have Orange with Mage. And I know he's he loves the Tempo Mage in general. So. Yeah, Tempo Mage as well has come, had a bit of a big comeback in the, the recent uh, BlizzCon Top 40 events, both for NA and, and EU. I think NA more than EU, it was really popular. Several players brought it back with uh, slightly different builds in terms of whether they were running secrets, which secrets they were running. Uh, the Ronin inclusion was controversial for some players as well. Um, but yeah, if it is Tempo Mage, no surprise to see that coming back because that, that does look like a particularly strong deck right now. Yeah, that's true. And I'm um, really curious what will be the, uh, with which class will they be opening the tournament? Because mm. that's something like in this, in Conquest, some people actually argue there's no difference, right? There's slight difference if you have a um, plan in your lineup, if you like target one class, if you, and you don't want to show your strategy, an example, then you choose your, then you choose the class which is focusing on that the least, right? When yep. it's just not, showing as, as much cards that are targeting one class mm -hmm. like out of the ordinary right so you don't example start with a druid which has let's say ooze and harrison jones right so 
there's some differences and um, it, it, when the meta game goes it, it's more focused when we know that we can target something then mm. decks are also getting more refined and um, I'm really curious how will the um, what will the be what will be the decks of the players uh, today yeah I think just just following that lineup like the concealing information point I think maybe the most important thing to conceal in either players lineup is maybe orange's mage because um, mage is probably the most flexible deck that we have picked in these lineups you know priests can be control or dragons but they're both kind of the same thing they're just slowish grindy control decks um you know druid you can have a few techs in or whatever but it's generally just druid you know what druid does but the mage yep. you know mech mage tempo mage freeze mage they're all kind of viable options that you could bring to a tournament um so if if one of the players is looking to protect information i, I would imagine that would be orange trying to protect his mage probably especially if he's playing spell slingers an example right. i mean I wouldn't be surprised if he's bringing those. First of all, they're cool creatures, free mana, for free fall. I mean, those are decent, right? Which is also interesting because when we saw Spider Tank, everyone was like, wow, power creep. Yeah. Right? <laughs> everyone yeah. was bringing out the pitchforks and, you know, just tried to burn the developers. But, uh, but when we think about the game, free mana, free fall, like a basic, like with no no death rattle effect, like a vanilla minion, mm -hmm. is not that impressive when you no. think about it, right? And it's mainly because there are so much form damage um, damage sources, um, death spites, true silver champions. Um, I mean, the party shooter is like the best minion in the game right now. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of four damage sources which basically just deal with the free mana uh, free fall, and that's not that that much of a tempo gain as we'd like to. Do think of in the first place. I mean, Hearthstone is generally different from other TCGs or CCGs you play, so not everything can be related between, like, you know, let's say Hearthstone, let's say Magic, right? So yeah, it's kind of different. But I like Spell Slingers and they bring a really a lot of excitement to the tournaments for the viewers and for the casters. So hopefully we'll be playing those. Yeah, Spell Slinger has definitely um, sort of upped the, the variance in the Mage deck. I think the name uh, Casino Mage has been coined recently just because between like Flame Wakers, mm -hmm. Arcane Missiles, mm -hmm. Spell Slingers, Unstable Portal, like absolute nonsense can happen in that deck sometimes. So um... I bet everything on blue. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a really entertaining deck to watch sometimes, but it can be a frustrating deck to, to play with and against sometimes just because of like the level of variance between a bad unstable portal and a good unstable portal is just so high. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. I'm um, really looking forward to how we'll be going. I mean, I, li I like the classes, which when I'm a viewer of the let's say I'm just watching a tournament. I like the classes, I like the decks, which are bringing some really unexpected stuff because I want to be entertained, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but when I'm the player, I'm kind of like, not exactly fond of it. But yeah, right. there's, a, there's a really thin line uh, between, you know, being a totally random game and between a entertaining and uh, still competitive environment. Sure. Just, just talking about like new and interesting and unexpected things. How, now we've had a little bit of time for the the TGT dust to settle. How do you feel that it's done in terms of um, you know progressing the game, changing the meta, that sort of thing? Uh, TGT kind of surprised me because I was hoping that uh, Inspire mechanic would be more used than it would be uh, than it is right mm -hmm. now. I mean, it really has a lot of um, options, right? But it mm -hmm. seems too slow. That's the problem. Like yeah. the meta game is too fast. Mm -hmm. Even when you think about classes like Patron, it's a combo deck, but still can dish out so much damage. Right. And the, the Inspire mechanic is just basically too slow. Mm -hmm. So cards, let's say like um, Fencing Coach, yeah. would be really great if mm -hmm. that minion would be, let's say, just on the curve. So free mana, free free. Yeah. Then the Inspire mechanic would be probably used more because mm -hmm. the problem is there's not enough mana. To use um, to use those before you lose board control. Right. I, a... Just on that exact point, I was watching someone the other night. I think it was Kalento, and he was trying mm -hmm. out a, a hero power focused mage deck with the the fallen heroes and Justicar and things like that. And he had a situation where he buffed his hero power to two damage. He had a garrison commander in his hand, and it mm -hmm. came to, it came to turn seven. It's like okay, it's turn seven. I can either play garrison commander and ping twice for two damage, mm -hmm. or I can play Doctor Boom. Yeah, well, like, definitely. <laughs> wait, wait, but 
which of those two things is better, right? And it just kind of illustrates the point of like the inspire mechanic, although some potentially powerful effects can come out of it, the amount of mana investment over time that you have to spend into setting it up. Like you're just better off just playing big things on curve and just getting your advantage that way most of the time. Maybe that's not the best example because, you know, Dr. Boom right. on, in I, 7 is I, like, I don't think you would ever want to play something else unless you're losing. Yeah. And you have to like rescue yourself. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it's a good example. I'm always trying a lot Inspire Warrior, like a control version with Kodos, an example. It was okay, but I would still prefer to play a non-Inspire Warrior because, you know, it's more reliable. Um, but also, there's a cool combo. I've seen that two times go off. Um, called Dara Drake with Major Domo. Major Domo, yeah. That, yeah, that, that deck so is cool. a lot of fun. <laughs> that's true. Um, yeah, uh, there's a lot of options. I really hope just there will be some improvements in the Inspire mechanic in the next expansions, let's say. Right. There will it's... be, you know, just maybe one mana hero powers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe. Uh, that sounds terrifying, but um, it, it's kind of a thing that they did with the dragons, right? Like with the um, Black Rock Mountain expansion, they kind of did mm -hmm. the safe thing. Like we, we'd rather it was slightly underpowered than slightly overpowered. And then yeah. we came into the the TGT expansion. Then all of a sudden, Twilight Guardian, and now now we have dragons being a thing. Um, so I kind of like the strategy of like when you're introducing a new mechanic or like a new race or something like that, like a big impact on the game. They deliberately hold back just a little bit, and then if it still needs that extra push, they can just print two or three cards in the next expansion that you know just gives it that little push mm -hmm. that they need. Um, so I kind of like that for like the long-term stability of the game. I don't think it's a bad strategy. Yeah, of course. Uh, what we need is just a new Undertaker for Inspire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we have that Lowly Squire, right? Like, that's a great. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, well, okay, it's like Undertaker right now. Yeah, right? It's, like it's the old awesome. Undertaker with the. Uh, with the health bonus, right? That was the most OP thing, not the attack. Right. Like the HP. But um, the players are... I mean, we can already see the players. The cameras are on. <laughs> Orange is looking good. He messed up his uh, hair a lot, you know. Yeah, that's just the usual thing. Gara is super focused, as usual, too. And they will be picking up the decks really, really, really soon. -ish. By the way, uh, what do, you, what, do you have any predictions on the BlizzCon EU qualifiers? We have only eight players left, right? Right. Um, I don't know. I've been really, really impressed with Hoy over and over again every time I've seen him play. He's one of my picks to win this tournament as well, because one of the mm -hmm. players playing in this. Um, I think maybe in the long term he might get found out a little bit, because um, I think he wouldn't mind me saying he's a little bit limited in his deck choices. Especially um, with the patron, right? Right. He, he doesn't consider himself a good patron player. He might be behind the scenes right now grinding the hell out of patron to try and bring that up to speed. But he generally just favors aggressive decks, mid-range decks, and he really like leverages his ability to make good decisions in those sort of matchups to, to find his way to victory. But now we're down to such a small player pool, the ability to like counterpick specific players um, becomes a bit more intense. So if someone wants to just wall out Hoy, um, it's something that they're able to do um, quite effectively because of his, his uh, limited history and which decks that he plays. Um, but I think he's definitely a very strong contender. Um, who are you favoring? Well, I would say usually I'm going with Life Coach. Okay. Yeah. It's not because he's on my team. It's yeah. just because when I see people practicing for games, mm -hmm. I just did like such a huge difference between Life Coach and everyone else. Right. It's like. In, in, uh, in our team, I also saw a huge improvement just because of that. Mm -hmm. Just because everyone was, okay, Life Coach just trained so much and it's so well done. I mean, he's sticking to like, you know, spreadsheets and speci specifically training on one, at one point, like with, with, one, uh, with one goal at just one time. Mm -hmm. It's not like mish, mish, mishmix of everything, you sure. know? So uh, I, I can see that RDU and Ty's also picking that up. So it's really cool. And I think preparation when it comes to such high stakes tournaments uh, is like almost everything. If you go with a good lineup, then you have a really big chance of winning. It's not yeah. the other way around. If yeah, you're a great player, but you have a weak lineup, you most likely lose just, you know, two rounds deep or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, people, people underestimate that. Like, intermediate players who've got to the point where they're, like, good at Hearthstone mechanically, I think they underestimate the, like, the percentage of, um, you know, how important 
your overall win rate is mm -hmm. like based on things like your deck building your preparation your mulligans like things outside the game it's not just how well can you play hearthstone um so yeah life coach is definitely like in the absolute top tier of players for that sort of thing yeah but we're going into the game we'll be jumping into the gameplay in a few seconds mm -hmm. uh, as usual there are some problems with the spectator mode but <laughs> what else is new right ne neil novi here <laughs> Uh, well, we do we see the mage lead from Orange, in fact. Yeah, I was predicting that, right? Um, yeah. I mean, it's a good class to start with. Mm -hmm. If it is, the tempo mage we'll see in a few seconds when the uh, when the gameplay will be visible for our viewers too. Mm. Orange looking neat, and we are starting off. Go with the dragon priest, as you predicted. Right. And. Orange with the Temple Mage, as yep. we predicted too. Very good opening hand for both players, I would say. Yeah, Orange pretty much has the dream opener here. Um, Mana Worm on turn one into Sorcerer's Apprentice turn two, and then being able to coin what will then be a one mana spell is pretty much the dream. You'd rather that was Frostbolt or Flame Cannon most of the time, but if that Unstable Portal picks him up like a nice three drop that he can play for zero mana, then that's just an insane start on the board. So. Definitely. I mean, it's. If that would be like a Edwin Van Cleef from the Unstable Portal, right. basically GG. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. It's uh, uh, the most ridiculous thing, right? Yeah. Tin 2, you have a free 2 on board, you coin out Unstable Portal, which will be then an 8-8. Eight, eight. Yep. Yeah. yeah that's, good, a, right? that's a good hand luck play, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> you want to play a giant on turn 4? I played one on turn 2, buddy. Um, but like we said, uh, Gara definitely has the hand to compete with this. He has a, a bunch of his early minions. Interesting that he's still using the uh, Blackwing Technicians in his Dragon Priest. A lot of people have um, fallen back to the old reliable Dark Cultists. Um, mm -hmm. Just because the 3 4 body is, is good enough. And the Death Rattle effect is just uh, so nice. And it's such a, a consistent card as compared to, to Black. Exactly. So. What I wanted just to add like, the Dark Cultist just doesn't require anything in your hand. Yeah, exactly. And it presents a bigger headache for your opponent just because of the fact that the Death Rattle effect has a really big, uh, big uh, is a big swing. An example, let's say, against Druids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we see the casino has begun and he's rolled into a one eyed cheat that he's going to choose not to play here. And I like that because playing it gives the cleric a nice trade on the board, whereas now it kind of has nothing to do. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I definitely like uh, killing the, the two attack whelp there over the cleric. Um, many people might have been too scared of the cleric there and tried to deny the card draw, but he's just looking at the board state. Killing off the two power whelp just protects his sorcerer's apprentice on the board, which is such an important minion for this deck to be able to accelerate their early game. Yeah, and Garrod doesn't want to lose tempo at all. Right. At all. There's no time just to... Um, to just to hero power heal his uh, minion to draw cards he has to play some bodies on board and by the way the, the one i cheat is not bad against priest because the hero power is not able to deal with it yep absolutely and uh we saw the the played mirror entity from hand there so one of the things with playing a mirror entity from your hand is you get to deliberately pick which turn you want to play it into turn four against dragon priest seems like a nice turn to play it because we we mm -hmm, talked about mm -hmm. it at the start you know, the big powerful minion that made these dragon decks um, really viable in this expansion was Twilight Guardian. Yeah. Um, so by either stealing a Twilight Guardian or denying your opponent from playing one, that's a pretty significant advantage from playing the Mirror Entity. Definitely. And now, Orange is disappointed by, by the Mirror Entity. Yep. Only one, two free minion for free mana, basically. Well, sorry, for two, because he has the Source of the Apprentice. Mm -hmm. the, the, the most important thing, about the mirror entity is the fact that you use a card, a high high impact card, just to get a two three minion. Yeah, it's not that great. It's That's not a great deal. Um, obviously, mirror entity significantly more powerful if you get it from a mad scientist. Um, playing a secret from your hand in this deck is always pretty miserable. I've seen some players like cut secrets from this deck, or maybe even play with just one secret, just because anytime you draw a secret into your hand, you just feel pretty miserable about your life. Uh, I think Tice, in fact, your Nylon teammate, was the person that I saw playing with one Mirror Entity and two Mad Scientists in the deck, which was a kind of interesting build. Yeah, sometimes uh, I saw players cutting that, that's true. But at the same time, I, I think just Mad Scientist is such a powerful card. I don't think you should ever, ever <laughs> cut them just for the... Just, just 
because you have the chance to get a free card draw, which yeah. is basically zero mana instant instant spell. It's just such a big of a deal. Deal. Yeah, absolutely. Um, ooh, how do you feel about the the Drake this turn from Gara? Because he had the option to just Blackwing Corruptor down the Mad Scientist, but I guess he was afraid of the the mirror entity proccing, so that would have given uh -huh. him an immediate uh, five four just because of the way that the the battle cry effects work yeah. in this game. And I think that was the correct choice. I mean, you saw one mirror entity, you have no idea because this is the first game between the players. Right. How much? Uh, I mean, how much secrets are there in this deck? There might be one effigy, there might be one counter spell even. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the 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 this collection of secrets in the in the Tempo Mage deck has certainly got a lot more flexible um, since the introduction of Effigy. Um, players are very much split on Effigy because of the uh, it's kind of a, a bad card to pull off Mad Scientist in a way because mm -hmm. you, you, you never mm -hmm. know what your board state is going to be. You know, you might still have a Mana Worm on the board or something like that. So um, it's a bit awkward sometimes. But you know, if you do get it down and then drop Antonidas or something, it's just immensely powerful. So. Yep. And by the way. Look at the uh, orange hand. Antonidas into Ronin. I mean, Ronin is really slow. Yeah. But, <laughs> but when you have Antonidas in your hand already. Yeah. When you specifically have the Archmage in your hand to back it up, it's an incredibly powerful effect. And I don't think there will be any silence effects in Gara's deck, so that 7-7 that seven seven is guaranteed to summon the Arcane Missiles. So we're, we're, we're going to see this game go off very quickly in the next uh, few turns. Yeah, well, the one Shadow of Death will kind of help here. Wow, that's a great pickup for, for Orange. I mean, you won't play anything. Uh, I mean, you won't play Antonidas before Ronin mm -hmm. will die, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so that leaves, let's say, turn 9 the earliest, right, for Antonidas. So the Pilot Shredder is a really great pickup if the Antonidas doesn't get killed. Yeah, absolutely. And he chooses to trade there. No need to be aggressive, I think, correctly here. Orange is identifying that with this hand, he can actually win the long game here. So just mm -hmm, trading mm -hmm. and preserving the value of his drakes on the board is definitely the right play there instead of just pushing out right face. And um, Garrus, oh, every single time he's on the back foot. Oh, oh God. Is that good enough to stop you playing Ronin this nah, time? Nah, I don't I think it is. Play Ronin. You don't even have to trade here. You just go face. Yeah, I like it. I mean, you're, the point of Ronin is him to die, right? Yep. So, <laughs> you're playing an 8-mana eight, eight 7-7 seven, seven just to die. That's that's how powerful getting three arcane missiles is, apparently. Only in the situation when you have Antonidas in your hand. Yeah. If there will be no Antonidas, I would say you can trade. Yeah. But, yeah. And Orange agrees with you, picks up the face damage. Um, we do see a little bit of a punish here. No, uh, Honey Nova doesn't actually change too much. Um, it lets him save the Shadow of Death now for the Antonidas that he probably expects is coming if he wants to go that way, but um, using the Shadow of Death is a full ball clear, so he might choose to favor that direction instead. Um, it's tough to say. I think when you see a Ronin played like this, you are immediately terrified of Antonidas and how you intend on dealing with that. So if he uses the Shadow of Death here, how does he deal with the Antonidas on a later turn? Yeah, there's no way to deal with those, and that's a really big, big headache. Yep. I mean, you can get the dream, right? I mean, literally, the dream. Right. Nope. <laughs> nope. Yes. Nothing, sister. There was one. Oh, look at that. Spellslinger. Hey. Um, nice well, he's, to see you, buddy. We're not ready to go off with uh, with Antonidas yet. He has a pretty clean kill on the Ysera using the Flame Cannon, possibly in, in combination with the Flame Waker if he wants to. Mm -hmm. um, and again, like he just has so much value over the long term here that passing up this seven damage to face just doesn't even look that terrible right now. Um, I think the, the long-term advantage of leaving a Ysera on your opponent's board is is probably a, a greater risk than missing out on this face damage right now. Yeah, uh, I think you can... I mean, the Spellsinger is a cool card, but what if you give your opponent a Silence? That's... Or a Poison Seed. <laughs> or a Poison Seed, wow. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a discussion that I've had with a couple of other players about Spellslinger, about whether it's really right to play it when you're significantly ahead. It's one of those, you know, how do I lose this game sort of mm -hmm, situations. Mm -hmm. And Spellslinger can introduce worlds where you do lose one games. You know, really, really weird situations that will happen very rarely. Um, but I think most of the time, just like when you're when you're ahead and you're pushing for pressure, I think valuing just having the three four body is probably right. Wow, the Shadow of Death is really painful here. I mean, the problem is the. Uh, is the fact that you already gave up a creature for that. 
Right. He was trying to find some way to fight for it on the board using the Ysera, but it just turns out that it picked up even more value before he was forced to use the Shadow of Death. And now here we go. The fact yep. that he's delayed all the way until turn 10 here as well, you know, he, he just... Yeah, wow. <laughs> there's, there's okay. no way. I just wanted to say that there's no way Gara can make a comeback here. There's literally no way that Priest can make a comeback in this situation. Mm -hmm. and even if you have um, mind control, you use your whole turn just to get the Antonidas, right. then gets just pinked and fireballed into the face, and you just lost the game because you getting damage at the same turn so yeah yeah and that was definitely the fear we talked about it when the ronin came down he, he knew if he used that shadow of death he was going to be in trouble as soon as he saw the antonidas appeared so i think he made the right play in in pushing for the yasera and trying to fight mm -hmm. the board with the 412 i think that was definitely the right play but it just it just didn't work out he ended up getting even less value for his shadow of death because he had to use it after he was after the uh, 7 7 had already picked up the yasera on a trade um, and then, yeah, the, the Antonidas just comes down and absolutely crushes the game. So, uh, good game one there for Orange. Picks up the win with his Tempo Mage. Now has his Druid and Priest left to choose from. And is switching to Priest. He is, indeed, going with Priest. Mm -hmm. So, a few of, um, we'll be seeing the gameplay in a few seconds. Uh, what was the interesting thing is the Nexus Champion, Sarad, right? Yeah. Does that incline um, more Inspire creatures? Yeah, it's very possible. Um, I've been watching uh, Zealot play a lot of Priest recently, and I saw him messing around with Inspire with, with Kodo Riders and, and cards like that in his deck. Um, I suspect that... Oh, wow, it's just Dragon Priest. He's playing Twilight Guardian. So he's just playing Nexus Champion Sarad in Dragon Priest. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Have any thoughts on that, Lothar? Um, It's cool. I mean, you have to drop something... What, what are the five drops in your Dragon Priest? Azure Drakes, Drakes and Black Volt, and Corruptors. And uh, sometimes and Volt. Volt. Yeah. yeah, and he had the Volt in the open hand already. Mm -hmm. So we know that unless he dropped like the basic four cards that you have to use in Dragon, Bri in Dragon Priest, you're playing six five drops. Right. Seems and like that a lot. Seems a lot, first, first of all. So I would say you can cut a really end game a really high end game minion like um let's say nefarian icira sure um it's really hard to tell i mean if you think about it sarad is basically a seven drop if mm -hmm. you want to get the full value yeah that's that's true yeah so you're probably looking at i guess some of these builds have been playing both yasera and confessor peltris so it might be he's playing you know yasera and uh, nexus champion instead um that could make some sense but just going mm -hmm. back to the, the game progressing here, we saw um, you predicted that Gara wouldn't be running Patron. It seems, in fact, that he is. He's just yeah. come, he's come over to the dark side, Lothar. We're, play, we're playing some Patron Warrior. Unfortunately. Oh, okay, yeah. I, 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 I know your uh, relationship with Patron Warrior, Lothar. Right? I read it's very, very similar to Innervate. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Um, but yeah, yeah uh, Orange just had an incredibly good start. Um, Early Norsha Cleric into Velen's Chosen is one of the most powerful things this deck can do. Yeah, and, uh, but Gara... the warrior has a really easy way to clear that. Right, and I think just because you have the security of having the second execute in your hand, you can you can go ahead and do it here. Um, generally in this matchup, this is just a, a stall and OTK matchup for the patron player. So you'd like to preserve one execute if you can to make that mm -hmm. push through a, through a Twilight Guardian if you need to. Oftentimes you don't even need it if you've managed to get a good Emperor hand and you can just use your patrons to to chop down the board and, and buffer frothing while it's doing it. So I think it's yep. absolutely right to just throw away and execute on the, the Velen's Chosen Cleric there. On point analysis, so cool. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, it's really cool to execute a minion that already has two buffs on it. Right. I mean, the one buff was a country, but at the same time, it allows you to use your hero power with an additional effect Mm -hmm. if basically you say oh well now i'm a priest lock and i will draw cards by hero powering so mm -hmm. i guess it's very convenient to use the execute on a almost three to one minion yeah it's one of those hard situations to like evaluate the actual value of what happened there because like you said the power word shield cycled and replaced itself um, and the Norsha Cleric had already picked up a trade on the Acolyte of Pain, but then the Acolyte of Pain replaced itself as well. So, um, like, evaluating the value on what just happened is is kind of a, um, a dead-end street, and it's just like, for the state of the game, this Cleric needs to get off the board, so I'm going to execute it. Let's not worry too yep. much about, like, what the value was. 
Ah, Garan is missing one mana to have the perfect solution yep. to while at Guardian. Yeah. And slam and and death spite. It's such a great way to deal with a six uh, six HP minion. Second execute. Second execute is oh, wow. gone. All right. So Gara accepting now that he's going to have to uh, fight through any further taunts the, the hard way, and there will be still Wormrest Agents that we see and another Twilight uh, Guardian to come if he draws it. I really like his decision not to play the Armorsmith there. It means he's keeping track of the coin in Orange's hand and mm -hmm. knows that the mm -hmm. Armorsmith was just way too vulnerable to Coin Cabal there. From my point of view, pro you probably won't play any one or two attack minion uh, like an Acolyte of Pain or Armorsmith, unless you'll be sure that one Cabal Shadow Priest is already gone. Yeah, I think also there's there's situations in the late game where you can just play those cards out and say, well, if he Cabals this, I'm going to kill him with Frothing anyway. Oh, it, yeah, it just, yeah, put, it just puts point. too many minions on the board, um, even if it's an Armorsmith. Like it, it, you, you normally out-damage the Armorsmith, even if it soaks up all the whirlwinds. So, um, yeah, that's the other situation where you're happy to play it. But until then, he's probably going to hold on. He'll only play an Acolyte if he just immediately enrages it, things like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, for a battle rage also. Yeah. yeah. But you need for that the Death Spot already on board with one durability. Mm -hmm. Or as you said, enrage or weapons. And those are usually kept for patrons. The problem is the priest, I mean, it's not the control priest, right? Yeah. So it lacks an immediate response to patrons because mm -hmm. most of them are playing maybe one light bomb most of them are not playing the light bombs at all right and holy nova is definitely not enough yeah and with one velen's gone as well so velen's holy nova is often the cleanest answer from dragon priest to a patron board so with one velen's gone as well we might see uh, gara be relatively comfortable making a board of patrons if it comes down to it um, mm -hmm. But I think with the, the Emperor, a Whirlwind, and a Frothing in his hand, he'll just be on the OTK plan this turn. Um, I'd be surprised to see him play an Emperor anytime soon. Um, I'd just look to cycle as much as I can, just as well, like, especially having picked up that Battle Rage. Um, I would love to see just a, a three card Battle Rage here and just fill up your hand, uh, hopefully, with uh, second Frothing, um, Warsong Commander, that sort of thing, and then uh, look to play Emperor next turn. Looks like that is exactly what he's going for. Uh, ooh. Uh, oh, he's attacking. Ooh. He should have attacked first. That's, I guess so, right? That's actually, Just... Yeah, that's actually a misplay. He's going to draw one less card. He should have attacked um, before... No, actually, it w there's no way of doing it unless you want to buff the Blackwing Corruptor to a 7-3 or a 7-2 as it would have ended up. There's no way to do it without gaining the extra armor first and injuring the Cruel Taskmaster. So unless he wants to make the Blackwing Corruptor a 7-2, he couldn't have drawn three cards that turn. Yeah, okay. Um, but, is... but still, there's an argument to doing that. I would value one extra card in Patron Warrior over two extra damage from a minion, personally. Mm -hmm. And now the armor also dies to hold him up, which is also a big deal. Yep. Um, so definitely not something we can call an outright misplay, but I think um, you know valuing the extra card may have been valid there entirely. Yeah. But a great hand anyway. He's only like one card, the most important one, as Reynard would say. Patron deck. It's a two <laughs> Warson commanders and twenty-eight cards. Yeah. And he's missing those two Warson commanders. I mean, one. Right? I don't know. I heard. I heard Death Spite was quite a good card as well. I don't know. Someone told me that once. Yes. Yeah. I still remember the uh, reactions to people um, saying Death Spite, a good weapon. I mean, when the next um, next one's uh, previews were being, you know, released, and it was like. No, you don't need another weapon in war. <laughs> it's like, why would you even need that? And it was instantly good, like, with all the patrons anyway. It was a really great weapon just to start with. Yep, absolutely. And yeah, this looks like a much better Emperor hand here for Gara. This is a, play, uh, a mistake a lot of patron players make, where they'll just play Emperor, you know, early-ish, like mm -hmm. slam it on turn six. Um, but in these matchups specifically, where you need to go for the kind of OTK strategy, you really, really want to hit very specific um, hands. And, um, and uh, I mean, at least two combo cards. That's right. what you mean. Yeah, the, the important thing is when, you, if, like, the combo pieces that I don't have, when I draw them, have I still got enough mana to play everything on 10 mana? If the mm -hmm. answer to that question is yes, then you can go ahead and Emperor. Definitely. And now that's a great hand, but it's still lacking the one part that we talked about. Yeah. And the, the minions that, you, that are staring at you, they have not enough, I mean, they have too much attack. So you probably want to go with the patrons. 
Ooh, orange is is going for the greed here. Um, I think if hey, I mean Gara. Uh, sorry, yeah, Gara. My my mistake. I, I think uh, I'm actually okay with this. Just digging hard for a war song, I guess, is okay. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if you're going to use an, an inner rage either way, there's definitely uh, an argument to to getting 14 power on the board with patrons because when isn't there an argument for that? Um, but, you know, the, the cycling plan here seems reasonable as well. And Garo right now will just be calculating damage and thinking about how many of these resources he can spend right now to protect himself and still preserve enough to oh, finish wow, the game. Oh, wow, he's going for the patrons. I just wanted to say that he has the hand that can dish out 38 damage if you will draw uh, the, um, the Warstone Commander. That guy right there. Yeah. Ooh. Oh, wow. Ooh, that is a lot of resources. So he gave up yep. two Whirlwind effects that turn with his Despite and the Unstable Goal. He also used an Inner Rage and he used a Patron. So he is lacking in damage in his hand right now. Um, and having hit the Warsong Commander, he's kind of back in the same position now where he's kind of waiting for the second Frothing Berserker at this point. Yeah, um, and look at that. Cabal Shadow Priest on the goal to clear the Patrons. Yep. That's super neat. It is. Um, he's just hoping that he could uh, get the extra damage he needed through having the, these Grim Patrons on board. Um, and I agree, like, once he went down the line he went down, he had to play the Unstable Ghoul because his Patron board was just dead on board, and there's just mm -hmm, no point mm -hmm. playing it if that's the case. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, Second Cabal Shadow Priest is just way too perfect of an answer, and uh, Gara is now in a... R Never mind, Gara's in a pretty good spot, actually. That's lethal, right? <laughs> that's lethal, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. Just pattern things. <laughs> yep. Hashtag. I mean, remember, guys, you can always tweet about the tournament by including a hashtag ABUSGT in your tweet. And that will, that will appear most likely on the uh, lower side of the stream. So be sure to tweet that. Oh, yeah, just patron things. Yeah. If you want to tweet to us about how fair this turn right now is, then you can go ahead and do that and uh, perhaps get your, your five minutes of fame on stream. Um, but yeah, I believe he's one or two over with the Fiery War Oaks. Oh no, way more than that. No, 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 that's like... <laughs> All right. It's ridiculous, to be honest. Yeah, it is. Okay, but uh, if you're a patron player, you want to go through specific patterns to know how much damage you, you will dish out. Yeah. Because th those are really easy to count. Yeah. If you have practice, or you even make notes. An example, yeah. 10 mana, uh, Wilson Commander, patron, and Frothing Berserker with Death Spider on board and a Whirlwind effect, mm -hmm. that's 38 damage, of course, after after Emperor. It sounds like improbable because that's so much cards, mm -hmm. right? But at the same time, it's not really that uh, like uncommon to see. Right. And those are the situations that you want to instantly see because they're taking so much time yep. to uh, do all those actions. You want to be sure, okay, I have lethal, so I just play the cards, link the cards left, right, and, and just go with everything you have to I'll play to kill your opponent because you might run out of time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, learning, learning to, to the shortcuts to Patron Warrior is definitely a, a good way to do it. Because if you spend that, if you spend too much time counting the maths every turn, you're just going to get roped on animations. But we are back into the game here. It's currently one-one. Uh, Orange has picked up a win with his Mage, Gara with his Warrior, and we're going to see Dragon Priest against Druid. Uh, Gara playing the Druid. How do you feel about this matchup, Lothar? Uh, the I usually favor the, the priest so much in this matchup. I mean, uh, it's basically the same classes. Sure. But there's no innervates in priest, but there's a lot of healing mm -hmm. on the side of the priest. And that's a problem for uh, for the dragon player. I mean, for, for the druid player, because usually how you want to deal with creatures is by dealing damage. And if one creature has like eight HP, yeah. how do you do that? Right. Um, druids tend to struggle with... Um really big tempo swing turns um you know things like fire elemental can be enormous against um against druid just something that comes on and replaces a big minion with a big minion of your own and we see of course you know the dragon deck famously blackwing corruptors is that exact sort of effect and if you can swing the game and just put um put druid behind on one turn then druid is not a deck that likes to try and climb back onto the board they just want to be effectively trading every turn or just pushing damage to face and setting up for a combo um, but it's interesting, I think like the original way that Priest always uh, beat Druid is uh, Blademaster Circle early. That's not an option that we see in this deck. Um, so do, yeah. you, do you favor Dragon Priest more than Control Priest against a Druid? Or? Definitely, because okay. the Control Priest is usually... Uh, sorry, rewind. 
usually relying, as you said, on the injured blade master with the circle, yep. or the other option includes also the circle, but also but takes the second part of the combo with Oakenite. I mean, that's the second part of the combo, which yep. means really easy comeback against the Druid minions because most of them have 4 HP or just easily killable by the minions you have on board or here power with the Alcani. Mm -hmm. And when you make that comeback and you don't die the combo, then you're probably good. Right. But Dragon Priest has is relying on big, heavy hitting minions, and that's what Druid has problems the most with. Right. Indeed. Um, but uh. Early, early game, I think, definitely favoring towards the the priest right here. Orange again has got the the one drop into Velen's chosen, um, which is just such a huge uh, such a huge presence on the board early. We do see a keeper in Gara's hand. It looks like he's trying to decide. I guess his only other option is just playing an on curve shredder here, but it just seems like silence is just the obvious option here, right? Yeah, I think so. One important thing that we didn't talk about, uh, we saw that the Dragon Prince player didn't have a dragon in the opening hand. Mm -hmm. That says a lot about the possibilities of the future of turns, mm -hmm. but you have to take into account that the dragon can be can be drawn. Right. So when you see that situation, you want to be sure that you, uh, you are, let's say, um, paying attention mm -hmm. which cards are being drawn and which cards are being played. So right. if you know that the cards that were in the opening hand were not dragons, mm -hmm. will be still sitting there, you have some options like to play around Black and Corruptor, to play around Twilight Guardian, mm -hmm. and such stuff like that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's hard to the the power chill play. It's hard to like make a call of okay, he definitely has no dragons in his hand because obviously he's he's drawing two cards before he next gets to play. Yeah, you know, he's drawn the card he cycled off the power shield, and then he gets his natural draw when the turn passes to him. But what you definitely can do, as you said, is okay. You know, put a mental pin on the cards that were in his hand at that point and say, okay, none of those cards are dragons. Now I have some information about the deck. Yeah. Um, but yeah, speaking of uh, the thing that we said is always fantastic on turn seven earlier, it's even better on turn five, Lothar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a good answer. There is a good answer, but you know, trade your minion and a Holy Nova, take four damage to face. I mean, the, the very fact that you're happy about that exchange, right, tells you how good Dr. Boone is. Yep, it's not bad when you can follow it up by an Emperor, which might be not contested, which might not be killed by a Shadow of Death, but there is one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just really insane. Because the, the, the value of two Ancient of Laws, which are discounted, yeah. it's just immense. Because usually the seven mana uh, is a problem to fit it in, into the cure, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, odd numbers are not really well designed to combo with other cards. But in this situation, you have an even even cost of the for the cards. So you can, for example, play a Swipe with the Ancient of Law. Mm -hmm. And that's really important. Yeah, or uh, even just, you know, if you're holding combo in your hand and you just need pressure on the board, turn 10, six mana, Ancient of Law, top deck of Shredder, dump that out there as mm -hmm. well. Just so much pressure on the board for, for combo next turn. But uh, Vol'jin was a really, really important pickup from Orange there, just to stay competitive on the board for one turn. But we see uh, Gara's hand is just stacked full of value right now. That three mana pilot yeah. shredder just helping him to, to maintain tempo here. Definitely. The problem with um, the priest right now is the fact that it doesn't really have that much card advantage. And you have to right. rely on producing that by Cabo Shadow Priest, by Ysera. Ysera is a pretty good card yeah. for generating card advantage, right? Yeah. Um, I love the face attack here. Um, a, a, a very big number of um, Ysera cards, you know, Nightmare and Ysera Awakens specifically, and then even uh, Twilight Drake? What's the card called? No, it's not Twilight, is it? Emerald Drake. Emerald Drake. Yeah, the 7-6, the again, that's a very aggressive card, so um, although Ysera is classically considered a very control card and it's seen in slow decks, when you get it on the board, you, you are quite often in a position where you can start pushing, and with his opponent at 13, with seven power on board, he's in a position here that he can he can try and race a druid, which is doesn't often end up well, but he may be able to force some trades here from from Gara. Mm hmm. That's a very good point. But still, he has such a huge, huge hand. Now it's just the, he has to find a way to use that, to, you know, in a good way. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Palutzer probably the best option. 
and just go face, right? Just yeah. to set up lethal this next the, turn. This is the decision now. Is he going to engage the race? It looks like he is. He knows he's not dead to any single Ysera. Oh, oh. He does choose to bail out. Okay. It's a slight misplay with the second uh, pilot shredder's placement because it should be like in the middle. The first one should be in the middle, right? I mean, that might kind of say to us that he didn't want to trade in the right. first place. And it did look, just from his mouse movements, it did look like he was very undecided and he changed his mind at the last minute. Uh, looked like he was mm -hmm. planning to go face. Um, I think I did do favor the face attack there. Like I said, he's not, he wasn't dead to any one Ysera card. It would have had to be a combination of two cards. But um, still, I think maybe he considers he has enough value in his hand to race Ysera over the long term. So um, interesting to see like how he, how he plays out the next few turns and whether he is planning to, to step up the aggression at some point. Mm-hmm. In this situation, the... Ooh, that holy smite, though. Wow, that's a really great pickup, but it, it just changed my whole sentence. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we're going to see the Nova restoring the value on his Ysera, and then a... Oh, okay, he's going to choose... Oh, he doesn't have the mana for holy smite, my mistake. I was thinking maybe just should spare uh, the holy Nova. I mean, yeah. the 1-1 the, the minion is not a, that big of a deal. It's true, um, but he does, you know, it does buff up his Ysera's health, so it's less likely to get removed from the board by damage. It does restore some of his own health. Um, although, if he used the Holy Smite instead, he would have had the spare mana to heal anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, you're probably right. Maybe just Holy Smiting the Shredder was, was safer. Uh, I mean, the problem is you can't play Cabal Shadow Priest with Holy Nova next turn. Right. That's that, that's a very good point, yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, right, but I like Gara that. is looking for that Savage Roar. There's no one. There's, there's none, none in the last four cards that he was drawing for. Yeah. That's really unfortunate for him. Ancient of War here, he should feel pretty comfortable with. He's seen one death. He's seen Vol'jin, which are the two best answers to Ancient of War. Um, but, you know, with, with, a, with a hand that's starting to fill up with your Sarah cards, you probably expect your opponent to have a decent answer like Dream. But uh, Nightmare will have to do here. It's not perfect, but it gets the job done. I can see. Yeah, and Gara's giving up here. I mean, no wonder. Like, yeah. <laughs> the amount of minions that this priest is just dishing out every single turn. Yeah. How many games do you win where Ysera has been stuck on the board for four turns, Lothar? I don't think it's too many, right? <sighs> I don't think so. No. Like, even Nightmare is making such a huge difference there. Yeah. Because you can just <laughs> stack up so much damage. It's insane. By the way, Nightmare is actually really good when you're playing Priest, because that it's kind of combining with your Shadow Ward death. Right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um... In that situation, of course, we just saw it used just to push through enough, and uh, Gara basically played that that Ancient of War as his, his last Hail Mary to try and get some value on the board, and when it got dealt with so cleanly, he just, mm -hmm. just pieced out of the game, which I don't blame him for. So Orange now goes out to a 2-1 lead, and we see him trying to pick up the win with his final deck, which is now Druid. True, and now we'll be, we'll be seeing a good opening hand from Gara, but I think even better one from Orange, right? And there's no no way of buffing that Twilight World to more than two attack. Uh, he would need uh, Coin Balance is the only way to do it. That uh, would be the dream. That would be the dream. He's I think um, Orange has has had that in both games that he's played Priest. Um, Gara no such luck as of right now. So mm -hmm. he is going to have to allow Orange just to curve naturally into his Pilot Shredder. Um, and then is he going to choose to pick up the trade voluntarily here? He is, yeah. I like that. Just protect the front body of your Shredder by uh, trading into the 3-2. Hmm. Yeah, and these, these two threes just don't look very competitive yeah. right now against that, that pilot Shredder. Those better zombie chows are not that great. No. Uh, but, you know, ah, there we go. Oh, I was about to say, Orange is kind of looking for something to do this turn. Shade will do just not, just fine. Um, obviously, Second Shredder or uh, Savage Combatant, if he's playing that, would have been preferred. But he'll just have to make do with the Shade, I guess. Poor Orange, right? Definitely. <laughs> I mean, you don't have that, that many options right now. You have to play Black and Corruptor and trade. Mm hmm Interesting. Interesting ordering. Coin first, then trade, then Black Wing. I mean, that's fine, because... Look at that, just the 3 HP minion wouldn't be able to uh, trade with the with your Twilight Whelp. So definitely a good decision from Gara. 
Yeah, I'm just interested as to what um, if there was any specific reasoning why he coined first before he traded. Because uh, there's no drops that would impact him playing the coin, right? Yeah, well, I was sure that he, he just knows what he has to do, right? Right. There was no option unless... No, even if that's a... Uh, if the drop would be, let's say... Um... Stone splinter trog or something like that. Like, it doesn't matter because you're just going to kill it anyway, right? If yeah, I'm the coin, so. thinking about maybe Milhouse Mana Storm. You still have to play... You still have to play the crafter in that. Right. Yeah. All right. Um, wow. Orange is uh, drawing quite nicely off the top of his deck right now. Um, yeah. It looks like he's going to see if uh, Keeper of the Grove has any merit here. But even then, I, I don't like playing the Keeper too much. Just directly into a Priest turn six. Just seems like yes. a good way to, to let him come back onto the board. Seems like a good way to lose tempo. Right. Um, we see again, Gara, no such luck with the draws here, does not have the Cabal, but still one more card left to draw, and... No. Is he even playing the Cabal? I mean, he's playing Shirkmeister, so he has to play Cabal. Right. Okay, yeah. never mind, never mind my question. But, <laughs> <laughs> I, I just saw some players using Dragon Priest with no Cabal. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a possible build of it. Um, there's a lot of different ways to build it. Um, um, well, what's the 4-mana the 3-5 buff guy? Uh, oh, my God, oh, um, you mean the uh, dragon... Dragonkin Sorcerer. Dragonkin Sorcerer, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. Um, some people play that, some don't. Um, the choice of, like, Ysera versus Paltris, uh, whether you run the Shrinkmaster Cabal combo. Um, I've even seen um, Zalot play the deck with the uh, Orkney Circle combo in it as well. So mm -hmm. a lot of people testing out different ways to play the deck. Definitely. Interesting turn here for Orange. Um, Azidrakes are, are scary minions, so you generally want to take them off the board. He has a number of ways to choose to do it. Uh, uh, you probably want to sacrifice the Keeper before he will draw that Cabal, because you already had value right. from it. Right. So why don't you get the additional value and just play, oh, uh, play, um, you know, not play into a top deck Cabal. Definitely yep. a good choice. Uh, chooses to Wild Growth, uh, so he can potentially play out his entire hand next turn. Is that going to be entirely relevant? I think when you're this low on cards, uh, I might have liked holding the Wild Growth for the card draw, but never mind. We, do, we just draw a Drake, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Uh, into into an Ancient of Law, right? Mm -hmm. He's still sure that there's no Cabal Shadow Priest, so he's going with the uh, Tempo Keeper of the Groove. Yeah. I think uh, having not played that keeper, sorry, keeper, keeper of, of the, the group, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> um, I think having played that, um, oh, sorry, not having played the Druid of the Claw for so long, um, I like being aggressive because he has so many good draws right now in terms of damage. You know, second swipe, savage raw, force of nature, all of these things start to represent a ton of damage um, when you add them to the to the charging Druid of the Claw over a couple of turns. I was wondering if maybe it's correct to just play second light bomb and then the taunter. I mean, your opponent is not such a low card, uh, low card um, number in your hand, right? In his hand. <sighs> but at the same time, you're baiting your opponent into a holy nova. Mm -hmm. But if, if he has savage roar, you're basically almost dead. Yep. Um. Hmm. White bomb. Be relatively effective here if he wants to go for it. Velen's chosen Holy Nova is just a little bit short. He'll be looking at a four damage Holy right. Nova, which isn't enough to deal with the. Uh... But Velen's chosen Light Bomb kills everything on board, right? Because you have double spell power. You have double spell power, yeah. So your Drake will die as well. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, Velen's chosen Holy Nova isn't quite enough. Cabal Shadow Priest on the two four isn't quite enough either. Uh, Shrinkmeister Cabal on the Drake. Oh, he's there. going for it. Is he going for it? Yeah, he's going for it. No, oh, no, he's, he's not. Okay. Okay. Yeah, this is fine. This is fine. I think this ends up being the best play, for sure. I think that spell power should buff the healing from Holy Nova and other spells like that. Right. Uh, technically, it's spell damage, right? So, like, auxiliary effects of the of the spell power don't, don't work, because it's... I don't know. I, I read the justification for this somewhere, and it made sense to me once. Uh, it was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Gara is not happy with how it's going. He's not. No. The Ancient of Law was basically a nail to the coffin. Because yeah. as if you can manage to hold the Druid low on cards and just deal with his minions every single turn, mm -hmm. then it's kind of okay if you're out of range of the combo. But now, when you see that the opponent is throwing additional cards, yeah, it's really tough. 
Yep. And he dies next turn, so... Yeah, there's just no way out of this for Aura, for uh, Gara. He'd, just, he'd have to clear the board, heal for five. It's just not a thing that he's going to be able to do with the resources that he has. He needed a Dragon and Twilight Garden. Yep, pretty much. And oh, Orange, look at that. Orange, Orange is, is toying with Gara. Flag out with the shades as he plays uh, Force of Nature Savage Raw here to seal the series. Orange will be our first player through to the second round with a huge 3-1 victory and uh, going out in style, Lothar. Yep, that's that's how Gara usually does it, right? With, right. With the uh, glasses, so... Yeah, the, the aviator is now for orange. And you just see a little, little pleased smirk just, just appearing on Orange's face there at the last second. So I think he's pretty happy with how that series went. And uh, like I said, Orange is the first person to progress through to the second round. So he's sitting pretty now and waiting for everyone else yeah. to, to battle their way out. Everyone from the viewers, if you want to see what are the information about the tournament, type exclamation mark Abios GT so you can see like information about the brackets. Also, brackets exclamation mark brackets also works. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to remind you guys, this is a 16 player invitational tournament with single elimination bracket. So we'll be playing eight matches today. And those matches are give me a second. First one was Gara versus Orange, second one will be Firebot versus Hoi. I'm so looking forward to that matchup. Yeah. Right about versus Hoy. It's going to be a fantastic game. So another Team Alcon player, mm -hmm. but against the newly formed Navi. So right. Natus Vincery, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll be jumping to a five-minute break commercial, and I'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. 